So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation for me to be part of your Congress. And secondly, uh, my apologies that I can't be there in person. I would have loved to have been in Antalya with you. Uh, a special thanks also to my friend um, Mustafa Karim for the invitation. But I think my plan is I will try and be there with you next year. This year, I have to be at uh, some family commitments, so unfortunately I can't be there. So the topic I have to talk about today is an important one, and I'll try and make this a fairly concise talk. The title is Algorithm and Surgical Treatment in the Management of Bile Duct Injuries. And I've divided it into two components. Firstly, how to try and avoid bile duct injury at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And if you in the audience are surgeons who do laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and if any of this information helps you to even avoid one bile duct injury, then this component is useful. And the second half of the talk is on the diagnosis and management of bile duct injury at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So, to avoid bile duct injury at laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the very first step actually starts before you get into the operating room, which is to anticipate the high-risk scenarios. So these are situations where there's a high risk that Callow's triangle will be difficult to dissect. Three categories. First, Tokyo grade 3 acute cholecystitis in a patient with a thick wall gallbladder. So Tokyo grade 3 means that there's organ dysfunction and systemic illness. And in this situation, it can be very difficult to define um, Callow's triangle. So beware of that one. Anticipate it. Two, in the less Less in an acute situation, the two are people who are, the categories two and three are less acute situations, but two is a chronic cholecystitis. The older patient, typically with a stone in a small shrunken gallbladder, no callous triangle. That can be a difficult operation. And in our healthcare system, people who have been waiting a long time, so recurrent biliary colic leads to recurrent infection, and you gradually obliterate um, Callow's triangle. So these are situations where you think, okay, there may be a high risk of bile duct injury um, when I'm doing the operation. So you anticipate it beforehand. Um, and then once we're into the operation. So uh, in our healthcare system, it's quite common for very junior surgical trainees to be involved in port placement. It's part of their training. So year one surgical residents, it's one of their key competencies to place ports at laparoscopic cholecystectomy, lap appendicectomy. But that's fine. They need to learn. We have to be treat, uh, training the next generation of surgeons for sure. But it's important to uh, look at wh where those ports are placed because port placement is, is important. So I use a standard four-port method. I know some surgeons do a three-port method, but there's very little cosmetic benefit from that three-port and the single port laparoscopic cholecystectomy was cholecystectomy was fashionable a little while ago, but it seems to have disappeared. So the first port placed at the umbilicus or just above the umbilicus, if, if, if someone is obese, I use an open cut down to reduce the chance of trochar injury to the viscera. I don't use a visi port because that basically is still a, a blunt dissection. And then the epigastric port is the, the first key port placement, it mustn't be too low and it should be inserted to the right of the falciform ligament. Otherwise, the instruments are clashing with the falciform all the time. The gallbladder grasping ports should be placed sufficiently laterally to avoid a clash with the camera and to allow um, sufficient proximal gallbladder elevation over the liver. So if we look at this in terms of illustrations, this is a good site for the epigastric port this is too low, so don't do that. The lateral ports uh, I've placed over there so that they're uh, about at the same level as the umbilical port, but they're well out of the way of the camera. So it keeps your option for triangulation. And if you also look, I think my cursor might move here. Yeah, the cursor moves. We have triangulation between the epigastric uh, port and the first um, trocar holding, uh, gallbladder holding port. So those are the port placement. Step two is how to grasp the gallbladder. And you see this where there are video records of patients who've had bile duct injury where the first grasp has been placed too low. 
So the grass should be at the fundus. The grasp, grasp grabbing of the gallbladder should not be too low. This is from Steven Strasberg's paper. So if you're using the uh, two-port technique, you have one here at the fundus and one somewhere lower down. Not here. Because if you grab the gallbladder here, then by definition, the dissection is going to be starting almost on the common bile duct. So that's dangerous. So a high grab is important. Then to do safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy, we all know this, a critical view of safety. It's one of the many great contributions to this uh, field of medicine made by Dr. Steven Strasberg from St. Louis. So you identify the cystic duct, you identify the cystic artery. Now, that is not always possible. The critical view is not always possible. So what do we do in that situation? So there are options. First of all, you can think about a laparoscopic subtotal cholecystectomy, which is a very safe operation. So you leave Hartman's pouch behind, and you so there's a cuff of tissue between you and the common bile duct. It's important to remove the obstructing stone and then there's a little bit of debate in the profession about whether you over sew this remnant gallbladder, the closed technique, or leave it open, which is called fenestration. I think that I favor the uh, closed technique, and that means you probably have to place some laparoscopic sutures. It's a good way to become proficient in laparoscopic suturing. Always leave a drain because nearly always there's a little bit of a bile leak. So that's laparoscopic subtotal cholecystectomy. Uh, a safe option if there's no easy uh, dissection of um, callus triangle. It's always an option to convert, but what I tend to say to the trainees is that is if that the gallbladder operation is difficult laparoscopically, it's going to be difficult as an open operation. So there's a little to gain, a little bit of a lot to lose because it's more painful. Uh, and it's also an option to abandon the procedure. We do see patients from our smaller hinterland hospitals where the surgeon has said, look, I went in to look at it. It looks horrible. I came out. Maybe get a percutaneous drain afterwards, or you can put a percutaneous drain in the operation. So this conversion phenomenon is not a sign of weakness or poor surgical skill or lack of courage. Um, as surgeons are type of people that we are, people feel if I convert, it's a sign of the fact that I'm not a good surgeon. Not at all. A decision to convert is can be a very sensible very safe decision so i'm going to talk just a little bit about open conversion if you have the ports here don't do that don't uh, join the dots because then your incision is right on the costal margin that's quite painful a separate small cocker incision is better the port size can be used for a drain and you can use a fixed costal margin retraction if you have it if you have to convert for bleeding what might be happening so from Callow's triangle bleeding, which is quite a scary thing to see, can be related to the right hepatic artery. Um, I dealt with one of those uh, about a year ago. Um, and typically this requires a transfixion suture rather than reconstruction because the distal end will be uh, small and there will be tissue loss. From the gallbladder fossa, which is much more common, this is typically due to end branches of the middle hepatic vein. And if you do liver resection, then you know how close the uh, middle hepatic vein end branches are to the gallbladder fossa from the inside. So they always respond to pressure, a little bit of flow seal or surgery cell. Um, you can put a single suture, but laparoscopically, putting a single suture into that, the uh, curve of the laparoscopic needle holder tends to make the suture cut out. It tends not to be deep enough. And then if it cuts out, you make the bleeding worse. This is a picture of a middle hepatic vein injury at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You see just blood everywhere. Uh, and uh, all you need to do is really pressure for a little while and it'll typically stop. Okay, what about the role of laparoscopic uh, intraoperative cholangiography during laparoscopic cholecystectomy? Controversial. In the UK, there was a survey which said that probably only about 17% of surgeons did routine intraoperative cholangiography. Me, in the early stages of my career, I did used to do it routinely, and I don't anymore. Um, there is one study which is very good in terms of talking about the benefits of that, and this is David Flume's study, which was published in JAMA um, in 2003. 
And the reason why I'm citing this study and only this study is its volume. So this is a nationwide retrospective cohort analysis of the US Medicare database for a seven year period. 1.5 million laparoscopic cholecystectomies with 7,911 bile duct injuries. I think that is the largest single report of bile duct injuries. So you can see that the incidence was 0.39% in patients having intraoperative cholangiography, not necessarily routine, but if you did an intraoperative cholangiogram, that was your incidence of bile duct injury, whereas it was 0.58% in patients who didn't have an intraoperative cholangiogram. I like this slide from the paper, which shows that if you do um, bile duct injury, sorry, um, intraoperative cholangiography routinely, so 90 um, surgeons, of the surgeons who do intraoperative cholangiography in 90% of cases over here, um, I lost my cursor, there it is, um, that is their incidence of bile duct in injury, whereas those who use intraoperative cholangiography much less frequently for 10% of cases, that's their incidence of bile duct injury. So it's not a cause-effect relationship, but it's quite a powerful piece of evidence. So intraoperative cholangiography does have a role. I don't think you can mandate it routinely, but it may be helpful. So let's move on to diagnosis and management of bile duct injury at laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So there are two scenarios really, aren't there? There's a scenario where you're doing an operation and during the course of the operation, you have an intraoperative suspicion of biliary injury. Bile is noted during the dissection and the anatomy remains unclear. What do you do? So the key is to define the anatomy. I think in our hospital and probably in most hospitals globally, I'm regularly involved in uh, IHPBA's international outreach program. So I go, out to, I go to Sri Lanka to teach. I've been to Nepal. Even in places like that, there are usually senior surgeons who can be called on to help. So I think it's worthwhile getting help because if you think you've got a bile duct injury, no matter who you are, there's a tendency to become a little bit flustered, a little bit panicked. Another surgeon coming in is always a help. Usually for the other surgeon, it, you're in a situation where you can be a little bit calmer and say, I'm going to assess the problem, see what's going on. An intraoperative cholangiogram may help, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because it might be difficult to do an intraoperative cholangiogram in that situation. As a general principle, I say don't convert a partial transaction into a complete transaction. Why? Because this, uh, again, a great Strasbourg paper, about the blood supply to the bile duct shows that from the, the proximal bile duct, the blood supply comes from the liver, whereas the lower bile duct has blood supply from the common hepatic artery and the right hepatic artery typically running behind the bile duct. So there are so many arterial branches so that if there is a side injury to the bile duct, there's a good chance that it will heal uh, without stricture or there's a good chance that it will heal. So the general principle is don't convert a partial transaction into a complete transaction. Okay, early versus late repair. You'll see this kind of topic uh, at IHBBA, EHBBA meetings all the time. To be honest, it's an irrelevant debate. And I have a couple of slightly controversial things, and this is one of them. So it's like this. If the scenario is that of biliary peritonitis, after laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the patient is unwell. They have, actually, if they have localized peritonitis, we're probably going to do a scan, get a percutaneous drain. If the percutaneous drain shows a high volume persistent bile leak in most healthcare systems, that patient is then going to be referred on to a specialist GI surgeon or HPB unit, okay? If the scenario is generalized peritonitis, early after laparoscopic cholecystectomy in the first 48 hours, typically that patient will have a relook scope because in this situation, we don't know that we don't have a visceral injury. So it's all very well saying early versus late repair as if you know what is the label on the, the patient. But in real life, we don't know that. If we follow it in a scenario-based way, localized peritonitis, percutaneous drain, generalized peritonitis quite often relook scope. 
and you might then find a biliary peritonitis you can drain and refer. I was involved in one of these fairly recently where we were able to do a lot of uh, lavage, washout, and eventually we could see the cystic duct with no clip. So we were able to reclip the cystic duct and the patient was okay. So I don't say don't do that, but it can be difficult. Um, the slightly later situation is when the patient presents with jaundice and they have an ERCP which shows either a stricture or a complete block. So stent and refer to a specialist unit at that point. So I think this principle is if you recognize the injury early and it can be repaired early, go ahead and do that. But if you don't recognize the injury early and the patient has biliary peritonitis and is ill, that is not a good time to do a hepatico jejunostomy. So you have to optimize the, the patient. So if we rec recognize the bile duct injury at operation, what do we do? Primary end-to-end -end repair is feasible. I, if I said, if you remember, I said the, the bile duct is not completely transected. Don't convert a partial transection into a complete transection. People tend to do that. And then you're putting a hepatico jejunostomy onto a small bile duct. And we don't know where the ischemic injury will start and end. So typically that ends up with a higher or proximal migration of the ischemic stricture and you've lost endoscopic access. So if primary end-to-end -end repair is feasible, always do that. I avoid a T-tube. No, logically, intellectually, there's no point to using a T-tube. We're making another hole in a bile duct which already has a hole in it. Um, and when I give this talk in Manchester, I say, if you're a surgeon in my hospital, the Manchester Royal Infirmary, try and find a T-tube. We're not a liver transplant hospital. So because about 10 years ago, I removed all the T-tubes from all of the operating theatres and we cancelled the order. So we don't have a T-tube, which actually is a problem when someone wants to find a T-tube now, but we don't have. Uh, use a drain. A late stricture may be dilated endoscopically and late hepatic regionostomy done electively is much safer because the stricture may progress proximally and you then know where the proximal extent of the stricture is. What about that patient who's presenting with biliary peritonitis? So you can't do a reconstruction in that situation. We're going to drain the sepsis, define the biliary anatomy, exclude vascular injury either by contrast CT or contrast MR, improve nutrition, and then do a definitive surgical repair. The time of that is typically up to about six weeks. And it's one of the things in our healthcare system that I have to explain to patients that they've gone in for a day case or an overnight stay operation, have a bile duct injury, and then suddenly in hospital for up to six weeks. You may not need to be in hospital for six weeks, but it's not an easy fix. Fine, I'm going to just close now by talking about the classification of bile duct injury. So globally, probably the most widely used classification is that by Stephen, Stephen Strasberg. And it has been the sort of uh, mainstay of management and classification of biliary injury for much of the last two decades possibly longer. This is his classification system. I'm going to take each one in isolation. So Strasbourg A is a cystic duct stump leak. Uh, and my point with this, and it's, it's something that I've been critical of for a long time, a cystic duct stump leak at laparoscopic cholecystectomy is not a bile duct injury. Where's the injury? It's a clip dislodgement. So managed by ERCP, endobiliary stent, you never need to operate on that. Um, that never needs surgery. B uh, is very similar, but it's where the, the right posterior sectoral duct is separate uh, and it's been tied off. I think this is too subtle. Um, of course, it can happen and it can exist, but I think it's too subtle to really be important as a bile duct injury. In real life, this is rare. And my personal feelings, I don't think it's ever recognized. It's very rarely recognized. If you recognize it, it's typically when you do a scan some years later for some other event and you find an atrophic right posterior sectoral duct. Yes, I know there's a theoretical risk of sepsis, but it, it never tends to happen. If you tie off a bile duct in the liver, that segment tends to atrophy. So Strasbourg B, 
I've said rarely requires any surgery. I think the truth is it never requires surgery. Strasbourg C is the same as B, except that the right posterior sectoral duct is open. So potentially it's a disconnected duct. And if you do an ERCP, it may continue to leak after percutaneous drain. But because this is a small duct, it typically dries up by itself. D is an incisional injury of the bile duct. And I've always been puzzled by the, in, by the diagram which shows this injury on this side because to damage the common hepatic duct on its left side in isolation is really difficult because what's here is the common hepatic artery. So I think what is actually meant by this is much more commonly an injury on the right side, this side of the common hepatic duct. So this can be a diathermy burn, it can be a tear here from too much traction. Um, this is the kind of injury where I say primary suture, don't convert it to a complete transection, doesn't need hepatic ojejunostomy, but there is a risk of late stricture, so these patients need follow-up. E categorization, they're E1 to 5. This is a better diagram of that. So E1 means that the proximal common hepatic duct is intact for two centimeters, E2 less than two centimeters, E3 is the stricture of the confluence, E4 is separate, it's where the two ducts are separated, and E5 is a stricture with a separately tied off right posterior sectoral duct. Again, I think it's a little bit too complicated. If you ask experienced hepatobiliary surgeons what kind of injury is the one that I'm showing you, it's very hard for people to say, oh, that's an E3. The reason why I think it's too complicated is that the treatment of all these E injuries is the same. So E1 and E2, it doesn't matter if the stricture is two centimeters away from the hilus or uh, at the hilus. Both of these are going to need a hepatic ejectionostomy. And for both of those, the safest method is to open the proximal uh, left, extra hepatic left hepatic duct, what is still called the hepquino method, because there's a long extra hepatic course here till the falciform comes in there. Usually there may be a branch, an arterial branch to segment four there, which is often the terminal end. And if you open that there, you get a nice long end of bile duct to which you can do an anastomosis. E3, same thing. So a safe method is to extend the proximal limit onto the left hepatic duct. In this picture, it looks like it would easy, be easy to do that but it's never the case. Typically here, it's an anterior sectoral duct and the right posterior sectoral duct will come off about there and go back into the liver, what's called Hjotso's crook, very quickly. Um, so E4 is different because E4, you probably, if it's like this, you could do two separate anastomoses on the same Roux loop. And E5, um, I think if this is ligated, and it's separate, and this is right anterior, I would end up leaving that alone. Uh, it can be that there's a very small opening there, so I think I would leave that alone. So we have a proposal here, and this is a project which is ongoing, possibly will uh, work at over the next couple of years. There's a group of people who we're assembling for this. Some of you are in the audience with us today. To simplify this, I think the Strasbourg name has universal recognition, so we don't want to change that. But we want to simplify it, uh, very similar to the bismuth Corlett classification of perihyla cholangiocarcinoma. So that is still valid uh, almost a quarter of a century after it was proposed, because a 3A is a right-sided resection, a 3B is a, a left-sided resection, uh, resection, type 4 means you have to do something complex on either side. So the uh, bismuth corlet perihylochlangiocarcinoma classification, each type has a different treatment. So this is the same principle for here as A, B, and C. So A is a cystic duct stump leak, which is not a bile duct injury. B is a common hepatic duct or common bile duct injury with continuity maintained. The other criticism of the Strasbourg system, which is uh, corrected in the atom classification, is that the uh, there's no mention of vascular, associated vascular injury. 
So in this one, we'd have plus or minus vascular. And Strasbourg C is a transsectional injury, which needs a hepaticojejunostomy. Uh, this is a case which I was involved with dealing with. We uh, were referred this patient from another hospital. So this is an E3 injury. What are the key points here? How do we deal with this surgically? So surgically, we'd use, and actually before surgery, we had a percutaneous drain to deal with the sepsis. We had an MR angiogram to define the biliary anatomy. Um, and we waited till the patient was well. I think the operation was about two or three months after the injury. So the key points are right subcostal incision. Typically, the duodenum and colon will be adherent, so be prepared for that. Spend some time taking those away. To find where the bile duct is can be difficult. I know that sounds silly, but sometimes you can't see where the bile duct is. So use the falciform ligament to identify segment four. The um, promontory of segment 4B will take you straight down to where the bile duct would be and trace that down to the hilar plate. And remember, if the extrahepatic bile duct has been excised completely, there will be no bile duct there. So the first structure, I have a nice video of this, of a patient, where the only structure going up and down from the hilum to the duodenum is the main portal vein. So take care not to add to any damage that there may be to the hepatic artery or the portal vein. Maybe wise to place a Pringle sling, maybe take some time to get that dissection to get the Pringle sling. If there's, if there's a bile duct outside the liver, aspirate it. I use an orange needle with a five mil syringe, just to put a little bit of a uh, syringe in and get bile. If you put it in too far, you're going to get blood because it'll be the portal vein. Once the duct is identified, I open it with a right angle forceps and then clear the tissue around it. And if there's a little bit of um, uh, extra hepatic duct, then you're, you're okay. I also didn't say, when you say trace down the hyla plate, I don't say take down the hyla plate at that point because that's risking damage here. If you're going to take the hyla plate down, I wait till I've identified the bile duct. Then we know the hyla plate is above it. So the left hepatic duct has a long extra hepatic core, so you can open that up to the false form. Just be careful of that uh, arterial branch, the 4B, and the reconstruction is with a roux loop. The length of roux loop, textbooks say you have to have a 60 centimeter roux loop to prevent bile reflux. I don't think there's any evidence to say that. I think you have to have an adequate roux loop, which will be about 20 or 30 centimeters. I'm not really convinced that there's any good evidence to say that you have a 60 centimeter roux loop and it's important. So, in summary, for acute cholecystitis, use the Tokyo classification, it's good. Grade one and two cholecystitis in fit patients can be managed by a lap cholecystectomy. Grade three is challenging and be aware of the risk of bile duct injury. Every step is important, correct port placement, critical view of safety. If uncertain, options include conversion, subtotal, abandon and drain. When there's biliary injury, the principles are, or when you're concerned about biliary injury, define the anatomy, do an intraoperative cholangiogram, don't convert a partial to a total injury, repair may quite hepatic ostomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we may have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Silverdina. Uh, and now I am asking to audience if there are any question. Soru Varma. We have only one question. See? Because of the time, only one question. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much for this kind of presentation. I wonder what do you think about the, uh, making a hepatic ostomy, especially for the E3 or E4 with small uh, calibrated bile duct over a bilateral transhepatic uh, feeding catheter in order to secure or prevent the anastomosis leakage. What do you think about mm. this procedure? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that question. Uh, so the transhepatic um, uh, catheter technique, it's, uh, I suppose it's credited to Jean de Blanche. I have never used that because I'm a little bit anxious. If you look at what you do when you push a catheter through the liver, you're physically disrupting the bile duct, you're physically pushing 
um, the catheter through the liver parenchyma. So I'm not particularly keen on that. I would, in for E3 for us, quite often we will have a PTC in place beforehand. So if you, so that's slightly different. So if there's a PTC in place beforehand and they're very small ducts, I know that situation. It is very difficult. Uh, I will still try and do using maybe magnification, um, a uh, direct hepatic jejunostomy, and I tend not to use the transhepatic catheters. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sirivardina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.